Um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, we have four talks in a row, so hopefully um, you're still with us and paying attention. It's a, it's a bit of a long stretch. But I'm actually going to start uh, with a bit of an apology. I'm not actually talking about uh, guiding emergencies, as the syllabus tells you. Um, but what I am talking about is non-OB causes for abdominal pain in pregnancy. So hopefully none of you are devastated by the change of topic. Uh, so I have no disclosures. So what prompted me to want to talk about this today was a case I was sort of peripherally involved with uh, 11 years ago, so in my last year of residency. And in the 10 subsequent years as a staff physician, I'd be hard pressed to think of another case that has had as significant an impact on me, um, both professionally and personally, probably. Uh, and I would venture to guess that most people who were involved with this case, and there were many, uh, would echo that sentiment. Um, so it was a 32-year-old woman, she was pregnant, who uh, was normally very healthy, had a history of constipation uh, throughout her life, had been actually followed by an outpatient GI for that. And on her first eMERGE visit, she was 19 weeks uh, pregnant. Incidentally, she had had a normal ultrasound just three days prior, for, uh, a detailed ultrasound. She presented this day with quite severe episodic upper abdominal pain. It was associated with nausea. There was no vomiting. She was constipated, but as I said, that was sort of her, her norm. Her vitals were pristine. Her white count was 12, but so within normal range for a 19-week pregnant lady. The rest of the blood work was perfect. Her lactate was normal. normal. Her LFTs were normal. Uh, she was seen and assessed by the eMERGE physician who referred her to the uh, ob gyne service. Uh, they saw her. They coordinated an ultrasound. The ultrasound was, again, reassuring. Um, her pain did improve. They actually kept her overnight, monitored her. By the next morning, her pain was much better. She felt fine. Uh, so they counseled her about constipation. Uh, they started her on some ranitidine and Maxaran uh, and advised her to follow up with her outpatient uh, GI. Unfortunately, she did, she did come back. So about four weeks later, um, the day before coming in this time, she had had four hours of, again, severe, crampy upper abdominal pain. Uh, it did resolve, so she thought she'd sort of stick it out, assuming it was her constipation. Uh, and then the next day, it returned, so she came back to the eMERGE. Seen by the emergency physician, much the same story as the first visit. Her vitals were lovely, her labs were normal, her urine was normal. So she was again at that point referred uh, back to the gynae team. So the gynae team came and saw her. Uh, they decided, it was a different gynae, uh, ob gynae staff this, this visit. Uh, they decided to keep her overnight again, and they were going to coordinate for an ultrasound uh, the next morning. She did require quite a bit of morphine, uh, and her pain was, was tricky to settle, uh, but she did improve. She got an ultrasound the next morning that was read as normal, but of note, they commented that they couldn't visualize the appendix or the ovaries very well, um, but it was reassuring. And then also during this visit, the patient had mentioned she had since stopped, stopped her ranitidine from the previous visit, so I think maybe that sort of played in as well to what they thought was perhaps going on, that it was kind of a combination of constipation uh, reflux. So she went home uh, again the next morning. Now, um, over the course of sort of reviewing this case, it was 11 years ago, but uh, I reviewed all the documentation and the consult notes, and I wanted to sort of add in a slide here that I want to preface it with, I'm really not bringing this case up to, in a judgmental way, to sort of look at what things were done wrong or missed, but I think it's a learning opportunity whenever we have bad outcomes. Uh, and this particular point is to sort of talk about documentation and how important it is to pay attention to what you're writing. Not just from a medical legal sort of perspective of make sure you document enough, but in fact, in this case, more reread what you write, and for two reasons. One, it gives you an opportunity sort of in that moment to check in with yourself if you are falling victim to sort of the anchoring or premature closer biases that we can so easily fall victim to. Uh, I think pregnant women who show up with anything, nobody wants to pick up that chart because it makes everyone super nervous. You're treating two patients in one, and it just feels like the ante is, is much higher. Um, but additionally, if you reread your own notes, if what you've written doesn't match what actions you've performed, then perhaps that's sort of a moment to second guess what you're doing or what you're not doing. So uh, in the uh, gynae consult note, it was written that the patient was visibly writhing and extremely uncomfortable. Uh, the radiology note uh, from the ultrasound said that it was a technically difficult exam due to the patient's considerable discomfort and inability to lie still for the exam. Uh, 
In the discharge summary, it mentioned that she had required a lot of morphine, as I said, um, but the morphine didn't seem quite effective, but she, her pain did seem to settle uh, with Ativan. And again, who knows what the intention of that statement was at the time, um, but it certainly, in retrospect, has an air of, you know, were they thinking there's some supertentorial component to this woman's pain? Um, and then again, in the sort of discharge planning of the consult note, it was mentioned that the plan was if there was recurrence of pain, then maybe they would consider getting an MRI at that point. But, sorry, uh, but her pain did get better. She was improved the next morning, as I mentioned, and so she was discharged home again. And of course, given my tone, she obviously came back. Uh, at this point, she was 28 weeks gestational age. This was her third and final visit. Uh, in our hospital, once you are viable, often you go straight up to the maternity ward for an assessment initially, so that's what happened. She went straight up to maternity. She saw the same ob gyne staff as she had on her first visit, uh, happened to be on again. So they did do an NST. It was reassuring, and so the patient was sent back to the eMERGE um, with the staff saying, listen, we don't think that this is an OB cause for her pain. She needs further workup, uh, and the plan was that they were going to come back the next morning to, to reassess her. And, uh, so she was seen by the eMERGE doc. Again, vitals lovely. A little bit of a jump in her white count this time compared to previous. It was 16, but again, not, nothing spectacular, especially considering she was pregnant. She had a bit of a hypokalemia. Um, and the emergency resident uh, that night, who's now staff, obviously, I was chatting with her about this case, and she vividly remembers, at this point, uh, the patient and her husband chatting and the, patient, the husband saying, listen, let's just go home. It's the same thing that happened the last two times. Let's sleep in her own bed. And the patient herself saying, I just, I don't feel right. Something feels off. I think we should stay. So they did stay. Uh, she was kept in the sort of DTU of our eMERGE at that time. Uh, she was not, she didn't have any constant fetal mon monitoring, which is technically tricky to, to coordinate, but she didn't have it. Uh, and then unfortunately, four hours later, she had a significant uh, increase in her pain. She started to deteriorate, uh, became hypotensive, tachycardic, and the eMERGE resident threw the ultrasound on, and she had no fetal cardiac activity at this point. So OB obviously rushed down. The presumptive diagnosis was a possible placental abruption, so the plan was to take her up for an inductive delivery. Um, but by the time she got up to the maternity ward, she deteriorated further, uh, more tachycardic, more hypotensive, so they took her to the OR uh, and opened her up, and upon opening her up, realized that her entire small bowel was completely necrosed. Uh, so she had an intraoperative surgery consult, which she actually had three, because um, the first surgeon who came in deemed that it was not salvageable, that a resection was not warranted, and that there was nothing that could be done. So given how difficult the case was, two further surgeons came in for their opinion, and, and they concurred. So she was made palliative. Uh, and transferred to ICU. I happened to be on ICU that night as a resident, which is why I was sort of peripherally involved in the end. Um, but she died later that night. So again, it's 11 years ago. It was an incredibly difficult case. There were many rounds held and many discussions held after this outcome. Uh, and the point of discussing these terrible cases is certainly not to judge the people involved, as I said, but to try and learn from them. So at least Retrospectively, we can sort of think about a few things that did come up as common themes. So one, she had no imaging offered or, or completed other than an ultrasound. She had three ultrasounds, but that was it. Uh, she did not get constant fetal monitoring in the eMERGE. Again, it's very hard to say retrospectively if any of this would have made a difference, but one thing that did come up commonly was if, she, if the fetus was being monitored during that overnight stay in eMERGE, perhaps the distress would have been picked up earlier, and then that may have changed the maternal outcome. Uh, and as well, Gyne was involved, very involved, but no other consulting services were involved in this woman's case, even when she was sent back down from the maternity ward with the question of, we don't think that this is an OB cause, what else is going on? So, what I want to talk about today is causes of acute abdominal pain in pregnant women that are not related to uh, the fetus or the pregnancy itself. And it's common, it's, it's stuff that we're gonna see. So one in 500 pregnant women will develop an acute abdomen that's not due to an OB cause. And as I said, everyone gets nervous to pick up these pregnancy charts, because pregnancy, making diagnoses in pregnant women is really tricky, uh, and there's many reasons for this, but one, the organs are all displaced and uh, out of position, so it's harder to rely on our classic physical exam. You can see in this picture where the appendix sort of migrates over the course of pregnancy. 
Uh, leukocytosis is unreliable, so at baseline they're going to have a mildly elevated white blood cell count, so it's hard to figure out how to interpret that. Peritonitis is also less likely in pregnancy, so in order to have rebound or guarding, your area of inflammation has to be in contact with your parietal peritoneum, and in pregnancy, your big gravid uterus sort of shoves your anterior abdominal wall away from the internal organs, so you don't get that contact. So you can't rely on that finding to sort of indicate a more significant um, etiology to the patient's pain. And then probably most important, I think, is fear of imaging. Fear of imaging on the side of the patient and fear of imaging on our side, you know. This woman didn't decline a CT or an MRI. It was never offered to her or, her, to her or recommended to her. So let's talk about non-OB causes of abdo pain. So these are the five most common things that are going to bring women to the eMERGE when they're pregnant um, with abdominal pain. So appendicitis, kidney stones, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, and obstruction. So for the scope of this talk, I'm not going to go through each of these things in great detail, but what I'm going to try to do is just give you a few little nuggets on each topic uh, that is different in pregnancy. So what makes pregnancy what alters these presentations in pregnancies? So first of all, appendicitis. Uh, rates of appendicitis in pregnancy are the same as they are in non-pregnant women. You're going to see it the same amount of time. Um, as we mentioned before, the appendix sometimes can be displaced, so sometimes it's not going to be right lower quadrant pain. It'll be right upper quadrant pain. But uh, actually, the vast majority of patients who present with appendicitis whether they're in the first or third trimester, they do still present with right lower quadrant pain. So usually, the presentation is going to be the same as their non-pregnant counterparts. What is different, however, is as tricky as it is to find the appendix on a normal, not normal, on a non-pregnant person uh, with an ultrasound, it's incredibly difficult uh, in a pregnant woman. As, in fact, in their third trimester, some studies have, have said that at, as much as 97% of studies could not identify the appendix in a third trimester uh, pregnant woman. So we can't rely on ultrasound. It's definitely reasonable to be a first choice, but if you worry about appendicitis and you have an equivocal ultrasound, you are not done. Uh, probably a direct relation to that, the fact that it's tricky to diagnose appendicitis, the risk of perforation in pregnant women is far higher. It's 43%, um, as opposed to non-pregnant counterparts is between 4 and 15% perforate. Uh, and with a perforated appendix in a pregnant woman, the rate of fetal loss is as high as 36%. So it's significant. Uh, as well, I think because it's difficult to diagnose and we are a bit gun-shy to pull the trigger on CTs, the negative appendectomy rate in pregnant women is uh, twice as high as it is in a non-pregnant population. And that's not without its own side effects. Post-appendectomy, preterm labor, and intrauterine fetal demise go up. Uh, after that surgical procedure. So we don't want to be sending people for appendectomies unless we know that they have a real appendicitis. Okay, so let's talk about kidney stones. Kidney stones, again, you're going to see the same amount of uh, kidney stones in pregnant and non-pregnant women, but again, you'll notice a common theme. What's different about it is the risk it poses to the fetus. So kidney stones have been associated with increased preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes, and early pregnancy loss. Ultrasound is a good place to start, for sure. Um, but it's, it's sort of medium in terms of its uh, ability to detect stones, especially if you're talking about the distal ureter. Very tricky. Uh, one thing that I found interesting that I didn't know before, but is that if you ensure that the radiologist does an endovaginal ultrasound, that'll increase the sensitivity of picking up those distal uh, ureteric stones. Another tricky thing in pregnancy that confounds things is that the uh, vast majority of pregnant women will have some degree of hydronephrosis. So if you think it's a stone, but you can't see the stone on ultrasound, but you see some degree of hydro, it still doesn't necessarily mean that they have a stone. Uh, so if you're worried about it, you need to keep looking with other imaging modalities, potentially. One nice thing about being pregnant is that you actually get physiologic dilatation of your ureter. So the passage of stones is more likely when you're pregnant uh, than if you're not. And vast majority of the stone is less than uh, a centimeter will get passed on their own. So people often talk about Flomax, and I mean, there's confounding studies in terms of Flomax in the general population in terms of its utility. But all the more, given that you already have physiologic ureteric dilatation in pregnancy, Flomax really may not add much more for the non-pregnant population. Um, 
That being said, they did a worldwide survey, despite all the confounding studies, and in the world, 97% of people who present to emerges worldwide, as I said, with a kidney stone still get a Flomax prescription, and 40% of pregnant women, despite what I've said, still get a Flomax prescription. So it's not advisable, but people are still doing it. So in terms of, as I said, most will pass on their own, but when urology gets involved and they have to intervene because it's not passing, lithotripsy is contraindicated in pregnancy. So shockwave lithotripsy, absolutely contraindicated. If you happen to be able to get laser or pneumatic lithotripsy, there are some studies saying it may be safe, but certainly not prime time at this point. So usually they're doing sort of temporizing measures, percutaneous drains, or ureteric stents uh, until after the baby is born. Okay, uh, gallstones. So you have an increased predilection for sludge and gallstones when you're pregnant. So we are going to see more uh, cholelithiasis. But actually, the rates of acute cholecystitis are exactly the same. So you're not seeing more of it in pregnancy, but you are seeing it. Uh, and the big difference is actually in terms of management. So these are not patients, especially in the first and second trimester, who should go home with antibiotics or after some fluid resuscitation. These are patients who get admitted, and our surgery colleagues are much more aggressive in terms of uh, early surgical intervention and cholecystectomy during their first presentation and admission. And that's because in the group that is treated conservatively in the first and second trimesters, there's actually a fourfold increase in fetal mortality in those who, are, uh, who do not undergo a cholecystectomy. Uh, in third trimester, the complication rate associated with cholecystectomy is higher, so they still will opt for conservative management initially, but again, have a low threshold um, to perform surgery. Okay, pancreatitis. Again, not something you need to worry about in terms of higher incidence. It's the same amounts, but the risk to the fetus is substantially higher than, uh, than I knew about, at least. You see significant premature delivery, intrauterine growth restriction, jaundice, RDS, intrauterine death. So pancreatitis is really bad for babies. And uh, they did a study actually looking at why there's so much fetal loss and, fe uh, and fetal distress related to pancreatitis in pregnancy, and the exact reason for why this happens doesn't appear to be clear. It doesn't seem like anyone really knows, but what they did find in a retrospective study, uh, and it's been replicated in other studies as well, but that it depends on the cause of pancreatitis. So gallstone-related pancreatitis is actually not so bad, but it's the patients who don't have any gallbladder pathology, and it's a hyperlipidemia-related pancreatitis that actually have a 31% risk of fetal loss. Uh, compared to a 10% risk of fetal loss in, in that other group. So these are patients, again, who aren't, shouldn't be going home with the sort of pancreatic rest, fluid and soft diet advice. They should be admitted. They should have fetal monitoring. We should be aware of the risk. And so how good are we at doing that? Uh, and so these were all patients who were admitted, so they already had that piece of the puzzle. Um, but as you can see, uh, in all comers, mild, moderate, and severe acute pancreatitis, only 22% during their admission had a, an NST, and it's better, but 66% had a fetal ultrasound. But that number should be 100. Given what we know about the potential fetal distress and fetal demise associated with pancreatitis, all these patients should be admitted and have fetal monitoring. Okay, and then finally, obstruction. Now, this is one that most people think that the rates in pregnancy will be higher, and it does make sense. I thought the same thing. You've got a big, fat, gravid uterus sitting on your pushing your intestines all out of whack, it makes sense that maybe that, that rate would increase. But in fact, it, it's exactly the same. Um, so you have the same incidence in pregnancy and non-pregnancy. What is different, though, is what the cause of the obstruction is. So adhesions is still number one. But what we find more in pregnancy is, in general population, 5% of small bowel obstructions are caused by a sequel volvulus. But in pregnancy, that number is 25%. Uh, and the thought is that if you have redundant or extra mobile cecum sitting in your pelvis, when you're pregnant, it shoves that cecum out of the pelvis, which increases the likelihood that it sort of can rotate around a fixed point. So if you're going to see it, it's usually during the times that the uterus is growing really fast, between 16 and 20 weeks, or 32 to 36 weeks. And maybe the reason we think it happens more commonly than it does is because when you hear the story, like the patient I presented, it's usually, not usually, but it can be catastrophic, and the stories are horrible. So maybe they just stick out in our mind, and it sounds like we're seeing, or feels like we're seeing it more than we are. Uh, the maternal mortality can be up to 20%, and the fetal mortality can be up to 26%. So how do we diagnose it? Well, you got to think about it, first of all. Uh, ultrasound, totally reasonable place to start. If you can see it, great. 
Uh, the further along in pregnancy you get, the harder it is to see on ultrasound. X-ray is pretty good. One study reported in first and second trimesters, you could see signs of obstruction in 80% of pregnant patients with an, with an X-ray. But if you don't see it and you're worried about it, you need to get more imaging. So which segues nicely into my next, um, next part of the talk, which is diagnostic imaging. So ultrasound is usually what everybody gets as a first line. It's totally appropriate. It's really good for certain things, as I mentioned. Great at looking at gallbladders. Really shitty at looking at the appendix. Uh, medium at looking at kidney stones. And in particular, I'll remind you that the endovaginal ultrasound can add sensitivity for those distal ureteric stones. So to remind your radiology colleagues. So totally good to start there, but if you're worried and you don't see it, move on. If you have an MRI, great. Get the MRI. MRI is absolutely uh, a perfect choice, but that's usually not the issue. It's, it's do you have one and or can you get an MRI within a time frame that's helpful. Um, there, historically, uh, there was some concern about, ultra, of, about MRIs in the first trimester. And that was related more to animal studies that so showed some ter teratogenic side effects. But this has been debunked in very large studies. Most recently, uh, JAMA published in 2016, 1,700 patients were looked at who had MRIs in the first trimester. And there were zero teratogenic side effects and zero um, intrauterine fetal death or demise. So yes, you can get MRIs in any trimester, but no to gadolinium. So gadolinium is still contraindicated always in pregnancy. It crosses the placenta, the fetus is ingested, and then it's associated with uh, intrauterine death. So yes to MRIs, no to gadolinium. But the real crux of it is the CT, because this is what we can get in the moment. This is the two in the morning test that we can get, but we're often very gun shy to order. Um, and I think, you know, logically and theoretically, we all know sitting here, that if I'm worried, the risks of getting a CT are far outweighed by the benefits of having an answer. And in, in theory, if you pull the group, everyone would agree with that. But in practice, as we see, it very often doesn't happen. And so it's this sort of weird thing in, in medicine where you get a bunch of smart people doing not smart things. Um, so I wanted to talk about if we want to have informed discussions with our patients, we need to know what the side effects are or the radiation effects. So there's two ways to, to talk about radiation effects. There's the deterministic radiation effects and the stochastic ones. So the deterministic radiation effects refer to those that, have, that only occur above a threshold dose. And then as that dose increases, you have increased severity of that potential side effect. So that's microcephaly, pregnancy loss, growth restriction. And then the other type of side effects are the stochastic or random side effects. Uh, which means that there's no threshold dose. It can happen at any dose, but with increasing doses increases the likelihood, not the severity, but the likelihood that that effect will happen. And that, those are the cancers, the childhood cancers. So um, being very conservative, you know, uh, literature, the amount of fetal radiation that, the amount of radiation that fetuses are exposed to varies depending on how far along you are in your pregnancy, what type of scanner you have. But to be conservative, x-rays at most are going to expose the fetus to three uh, millisieverts. Abdomen CTs, 35 at most. In our hospital, it's closer to five millisieverts. Uh, and a pelvic CT is the highest. And again, in the, in the worst case scenario, that's 50 millisieverts that you could be exposed to. And studies have clearly proven that below 50 millisieverts, which was the highest dose that you're getting from a, a terrible scanner, uh, you know, that is from a long, long time ago, there is no evidence of increased risk of any of those deterministic radiation effects, which is the fetal anomalies, the intellectual disability, the gross restriction, or the pregnancy loss. And the American College of Radiology put forward this table, which is helpful. So that was 50 or less, nothing. And as you can see in that column, none. In the 50 to 100 millisieverts column, they still say the potential effects are scientifically uncertain and probably too subtle to be clinically detectable. So probably not a lot going on here. And it's really just above 100 millisieverts where you're seeing possible spontaneous abortions, malformations, and risk of deficits in IQ. So really, the deterministic effects, not a big deal with that one CT. The stochastic effects, and again, this is the, the childhood cancers. So below 200 millisieverts, you don't have to worry about solid, can, uh, solid, solid cancers. What you do have to worry a little bit about, and this is where the informed discussion, if you want to inform your patient properly, this is what you should tell them about, uh, is at 10 to 20 millisieverts. 
So that was our CT pelvis and maybe even our CT abdomen, depending where you work. You increase the risk of childhood leukemia by 1.5, by a factor of 1.5 to 2. So the baseline risk of leukemia, childhood leukemia in North America is 1 in 3,000. So this would change that to 1 in 1,500 or 1 in 2,000. So, you know, that's probably the single thing that you need to be talking to your patients about and making sure that they understand. But again, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of cases where CTs are not done and retrospectively we are able to look back and say, oh, we shoulda, it's not because the patients are refusing. It's because we are not suggesting or recommending them. But it is still important to note that pregnancy does not lessen or limit the requirement to obtain informed consent or to honor a pregnant woman's refusal of recommended treatment. So if you recommend it and they refuse, you must respect their decision. But at least if you can have that proper conversation, um, I think that that's a better place to, to be. So I want to end really quickly. I'm almost out of time. Um, but with the last case. So this was a case that happened one year ago. So the first one was 11 years ago. This one was one year ago. This one wasn't mine either. But um, So a 28-year-old woman, 30 weeks pregnant, went to the Whistler Emerge with severe, crampy upper abdominal pain associated with nausea, no vomiting. She was constipated. Basically the exact same story. Uh, hers was a little different in that she'd have a previously ruptured appendix, like remotely several years prior, sorry. Uh, her vitals were good, her labs were perfect, her ultrasound in the eMERGE by the eMERGE doc looked good, good fetal heart, good fetal movement. She was in a lot of pain, needed IV morphine to feel better, um, but she did improve. And so the eMERGE doc spoke to uh, the OB staff on call at Lionsgate, told the story, was hoping to sort of coordinate a transfer, uh, and the OB staff declined, uh, you know, in the face of normal vitals and normal blood work and, and pain improved. They said they didn't think it was needed. And so the eMERGE doc sort of hung up and, you know, certainly this is not any protocol that we normally follow, but he just, what he says is that he had a, a funny feeling and he didn't feel comfortable. And they were driving back to Montreal, or to Vancouver anyway, so he told them that they should just drive to Vancouver and go to St. Paul's. Just because. And get checked out again. Even though no one, had, he couldn't get an, ex, an official sort of acceptance, so he told them just to sort of go in. And so they did. And they, she developed pain again on, on route, so it was good that they did. Uh, walked into the eMERGE. Again, she was 30 weeks, so she was seen and assessed by the emergency physician, but quite quickly, and then directed up to maternity. She had an NST in maternity very quickly. She, they noted D cells. The patient started to develop some hemodynamic instability, became tachycardic, became hypotensive, was taken for a STAT C-section. She was in the OR getting a C-section within one hour of having presented to the eMERGE. Uh, when they opened her up, she had dusky bowel. There was a transition point around the previously ruptured appendix. They got the baby out. They lysed the adhesions. The bowel pinked up. They didn't even need to do a resection. Uh, and baby and mom both did very, very well. And the emergency physician who saw the patient in the eMERGE was the same as the resident who had seen the patient 11 years prior. And the OB staff who was on call that night was the same OB staff who had seen the patient 11 years prior. And both of them say, you know, they absolutely believe if they had not been involved in that previous case, this patient may have not done as well as she did. So as hard as it is to talk about these types of bad outcomes, I think we need to grow through what we go through and learn from our mistakes. So uh, take home points quickly. Consider non-OB causes. If we don't think about them, we're not going to recognize them. Get an x-ray or a CT if you don't find your answer on ultrasound. And even though it's technically challenging to coordinate, and there's not a lot of literature around this, but consider fetal monitoring as another vital sign to assess how the mom is doing uh, in any situation of impending doom maybe picked up earlier. Thank you very much.